Hello everyone, welcome back. We are continuing the series of videos on great ideas in psychology based on a book with the same title by Professor Vatali Mouhatta. In this part, we are turning to chapter 18 titled Multicultural Psychology. This is our place in the general map of the series. In the previous parts when I was writing this list, uh, I wrote for number 18, instead of multicultural, I wrote cultural. And uh, that's something we should correct. So maybe we can begin uh, talking about that distinction, that difference. So our topic is not cultural psychology, um, not in this chapter anyways. I might talk about cultural psychology at some point in the future based on other sources, other books. Um, cultural psychology is a branch of psychology. It's a subdiscipline. It is, you can say, it's a way of thinking about psychology, just like cognitive psychology or theories of personality. It is a general way of getting into psychology. So cultural psychology examines psychological topics uh, through the lens of culture by looking at how cultural processes, cultural material, cultural objects, signs, artifacts um, enable psychological functions or psychological experiences. In contrast to that, so that's not our topic for this part. In contrast, multicultural psychology uh, confronts situations or social environments in which there are multiple cultures that coexist and they enter into relationship with each other. So, they have a perception of one culture, has a perception of another culture. We're not uh, talking about cultures, we're talking about people, so individuals. An individual belongs to a culture or a cultural background, and this individual enters into a setting in which multiple cultures coexist. If you are interested in cultural psychology, let me know. I am uh, potentially, I'm interested in discussing that topic too in the future. And one place to go, it's a little bit challenging, it's a difficult book, but um, An Invitation to Cultural Psychology by Jan Valsiner is a 2014 book. It's a good place to start studying if you're interested in that topic. Uh, it's not, again, not primarily multicultural psychology, but cultural psychology. Okay, now let's get to the multicultural psychology. Why are we interested in it? Why should we be interested in it? Well, because we live in a world now for many different reasons. We live in a world where uh, the places we live, the places we find ourselves, uh, are places in which more than one culture exists. Uh, people belong to, people who live very near each other in physical proximity, geographical proximity, the same city, same social environment. They belong sometimes to two different sides of a cultural boundary. So you might have friends, close friends, or classmates, or co-workers who have a different culture, have a different cultural background. So uh, the factors that motivate multicultural psychology include global globalization, <laughs> immigration, um, students in large numbers traveling to study as foreign students or exchange students, in addition to travelers and tourists. And these factors result in changes in demographic in uh, various countries or cities, especially larger cities. And as a result, these questions might arise, questions related to multicultural social environments. One question is about identity. In that, in a multicultural setting, you might ask, you might be more motivated to ask about the relationship between culture and identity. How much of your identity is about being uh, from your culture, having that particular cultural background? How much of who you are is about a, a culture? Another question is about the definition or categorization or identification. Once you have some ideas about your identity and its relationship to your culture. I ask, what is it that makes a person a member of my cultural group? If you're an American, for example, 
if you're Canadian, if you are uh, British, what is it that makes you an American? What is it that makes a person, any person, not just you? What would you like to know about a person to know that they are in your group? And if they can't, if they don't meet that criteria or if they, uh, they don't have that feature, um, a category membership or family resemblance, family resemblance in the sense of um, categories, then they would be identified as out group. So in group, out group. So we are drawing, we are thinking about uh, cultural boundaries and people belonging to different sides of that boundary. Then and another question that comes out of that is how should you deal with people who are who belong to the out group category? What to do about, you know, roughly what to do about the out group, um, especially the out group that is inside your territory. So people who live in your city, but they seem different because of their cultural backgrounds. I'm not talking about racial uh, differences, but cultural differences. What are the rights and duties towards people who are different in their culture? What, what is their rights and their duties? Or what is our rights and duties from both sides, from both sides of that relationship? And it is not just we individuals that decide about the, uh, these questions, how to think about these questions, how to respond to these types of questions. Policymakers make decisions and kind of respond to these questions about identity, about group membership, about dealing uh, or treatment of people in, across different sides of the multicultural divide. And then psychologists get to ask questions after the fact, after maybe some policies have been uh, proposed or established. So here's a passage from the book. Multicultural psychology addresses questions about the effectiveness of different policies for managing cultural diversity, managing cultural diversity, and the relationship between such policies and identity, and whether such policies are based on, um, based on assumptions that are psychologically viable, safe to assume, or, or not. So different policies, what is the aim of those policies? The aim is generally to eliminate, eliminate or minimize the adverse effect of cultural differences through common educational experience and, and language training. So one example is um, affirmative action, which is uh, in effect in many different countries, several different countries, not just in the US, but also in places like Malaysia. Uh, let's read another passage. This, this passage is helpful because it introduces us to two different ways of assimilation across um, a multicultural, multicultural divide. So um, let's say, there are two groups, two or more groups. There's one majority group, and then there are minorities. For example, the, the Muslim communities in um, West China, for example. So there are different ways of assimilating, making peace or making harmony or connecting, let's say, connecting and making peace across a multicultural divide. So there is minority assimilation, and then there's melting pot assimilation. Minority assimilation is when the minority group is expected to do most of the work. So the minority group is expected to learn the language, learn the official language of the, of the territory, uh, learn how to navigate through the culture. So as minority assimilation involves the minority group members trying to take on a mainstream identity by copying the majority group. Um, but, there's also the melting pot assimilation in which the, the, the work is shared. So both sides are expected to do some of the work and importantly, both sides as a, as a result of their interaction come, with, come up with their new identity. So both the majority because of their interaction and the minority, they develop and settle on new identity, new ways of understanding themselves with the help of um, another culture who is now close, living close to them. So based on the contribution, cultural contribution of all the different groups, that is uh, what the, we mean by the melting pot assimilation. Uh, so the pressure, the duty, the work is shared in that second uh, style. There's of course 
intergroup conflict is whenever we have different cultures, there might be negative feelings towards people who are different. So different groups might, might identify each other as enemy based on some key characteristics, something that um, usually it is an arbitrary feature like skin color or some physical feature or maybe some stereotype that they have. Um, and usually the way people think is that we don't have those characteristics. We don't have those characteristics of the other side. They do. That's why we can identify them. And the other group is usually um, perceived to be simpler and we think when we have an enemy on the other side, they all are kind of similar. We, we think that they're all the same, essentially. But we are, our group has um, diversity inside it and it's heterogeneous relatively. So that's a simplistic, prejudicial way of thinking about um, other people, um, other cultures, if you fall into that trap. There's a nice little book that begins with this, with the, with the essay titled Inventing the Enemy by Umberto Eco. I would encourage you to read this uh, collection. The whole, the whole essay is, the whole uh, essay collection, the whole collection is quite good. In the first essay, Echo uh, reminds us that people who belong to very different cultures over time and, and different times in history, different points in, in history, they have all said very similar things, strangely enough. They have said very similar things about people they identify as enemy. So for example, a common characteristic that ev everybody, almost everybody, um, different places, different times, have said about their, the other side of their culture, the enemy of their culture, is that they are immoral. They don't have our sense of morality. And they usually also describe the other side as uh, having some repulsive features like bad smell or uh, bad hygiene. So this is, these are inventions, these are uh, imagined features, or maybe they, in some cases, they are based on existing features, but they are exaggerated and overinterpreted. So for example, um, the example that is discussed, one of the examples discussed in this chapter is the conflict between uh, two communities, the Tutsis and the Hutus, uh, the, who live in Rwanda and they've had bloody conflicts during the 1990s and it's unfortunately ongoing. There is one physical feature, namely height, that is different in these two, on average. On average, one of the groups is slightly taller than the other. But because of the animosity, because these groups have identified each other as, as the enemy, uh, this physical difference, not only is it is exaggerated, but it is also interpreted to mean something, namely uh, one group's superiority and another group's inferiority. So when, even when two groups might look similar to outsiders, to third parties, I was like, okay, you, you're all from Rwanda. You have so much in common and your the geographies, you live the ecologies, the way you organize your groups, but the groups who have identified each other as enemy they exaggerate small differences in order to confirm the feeling or attitude of animosity. And they interpret that those small differences as very fundamental, uh, very um, and major indications of who the other side is and their relationship to us. Back to Umberto Eco, he writes in that essay, uh, quote, having an enemy is important not only to define our identity, but also to provide us with an obstacle against which to measure our system of value and to demonstrate our own worth. So when there is no enemy, we invent one, end quote. There are psychological benefits, in other words. There are there, some psychological benefits. Of course, these are easy solutions to hard problems. We can say they are psychological cheats. We, we cheat psychologically. Um, with respect to solving the meaning of life, uh, so giving our lives a purpose and uh, giving answers to the question, who am I or who are we? It's easier to answer those questions with respect to an enemy that we have invented and then we have described and identified. All right, back to multiculturalism. Obviously, multiculturalism in our time wants to combat 
uh, animosity, wants to combat people identifying each other in prejudicial terms, uh, in terms of enemies, in terms that are that that produce more and more conflict. Multiculturalism wants to um, provide us, well, or or create um, peace while maintaining differences, different cultural identities. So we don't want complete assimilation. We don't want minority groups to completely disown who they are, but we also want peace and understanding. So there are assumptions that multiculturalism makes. Uh, two of them, two major assumptions discussed in this chapter uh, are first, minorities are positively motivated towards reta retaining their ancestral culture and language. So this is one. I don't know how much you have experienced with um, living with immigrant families, near immigrant families. Uh, you know that this is not this assumption is not always uh, safe to make. Like there are sometimes families where the second generation, third generation, they don't care as much about knowing their ancestral culture and language. They don't really know uh, or want to know the language spoken by their grandparents. I'm not talking about whether that's good or bad, but this multicultural multiculturalism assumption, um, you can question, you, you can challenge it. It is not universally true across all minorities, uh, but it is an assumption that some people make. Um, and this assumption also goes into policy making. Second, when group members feel pride and feel good, confident in their own group heritage, they will be more open and accepting toward uh, outgroups. This is called the multiculturalism hypothesis. So I will be more inclined to accept people from other cultures if I already have a sense of confidence, a sense of pride in my own cultural background. Is that a safe assumption? No, no, you can also challenge this. You can question this, um, this hypothesis, multiculturalism. There are many people we, you, you can imagine or maybe you can recall people who are very proud of their own cultural heritage, but they don't feel that great about other people, other cultures. So just being, just having a good feeling about your own culture doesn't guarantee that you're going to be open and accepting. It has to be the right way of feeling pride and confidence um, in a way that keeps you open and humble about what other people can contribute. Um, our author, Professor Mogadam, also talks about limitations of multiculturalism. Uh, and he includes the focus, maybe too much focus on what is happening to minority groups or what should be done by minority groups, what should be done about minority groups. Uh, and this focus might lead, lead us to neglect that the main source of prejudice, especially in bias, tends to be in, uh, ten, tends to come from the majority group because they are the, the, the majority group is the, the group that is kind of getting out of their comfort zone, getting challenged and they have their own status quo. Um, anyways. Next, it assumes, multiculturalism assumes that pride in one's group necessarily leads to more peace. And historically, our author points out that is inaccurate. And last but not least, multiculturalism promotes tolerance. And what does tolerance mean? Tolerance means not, maybe that it means not bothering each other, letting other people have their lives, but keeping them at a distance. Maybe it means accepting other people or trying not to have a bias against them, but uh, when it comes to choosing a neighborhood to live, you actually, you're, not, you're tolerant of people, but you don't wanna live near them. The question then arises is, is this the best possible outcome? Is tolerance the best we can achieve? Maybe from the perspective of policymakers, people who are thinking in terms of society, Maybe for them, tolerance might be the best possible outcome. But from a psychological perspective, from a personal perspective, uh, from, the per from the perspective of individual human beings who are making decisions, who are experiencing multicultural, um, 
a multicultural world. We can, we might be able to do or aim at least or hope for something that is more than tolerance, um, something like mutual enrichment or kind of genuine relationship. It doesn't have to be peaceful relationship. It doesn't have to always be a joyful celebration. It could be like a peaceful conflict that informs us about who we are. Like being argumentative with your friend. You're a friend, but you're, you're still friends, but uh, you're not just tolerating each other from a distance. All right, final thoughts. Um, multicultural psychology. I mean, why is it useful? Why is it interesting to think about multicultural psychology. When we have um, negative feelings about other cultures or when, when we have positive feelings about other cultures or when we make um, decisions with respect to other cultures because of people, uh, with respect to people because of their cultural background. Is this all of this topic? Are all of these things uh, just about our relationship to people from other cultures? And are we imagining relationship between two cultures and each culture being completely homogenous? So let's say Western culture and Eastern culture, thinking about these two cultures in a very simplistic way as if all of the West is one thing and all of the East is one thing and they are homogenous internally, but then they have major differences from each other. Um, Multiculturalism is a way to me to get past these simplistic ways of thinking. It is, I think it is also about enriching our way of thinking about our own culture. When we are introduced to people who have different cultural backgrounds, we might become more reflective, more self-aware about our own, uh, about the differences that are inside our, our culture. So is it about differences between cultures, relationships between cultures, or is this also something that can help us think better, think more carefully, think more critically about differences within a culture? And maybe even more fundamentally, more relevant to psychology, is it about also differences within one person? When a person is very unaccepting of people uh, who are different from them, is this also showing a kind of prejudice, a, an inability to accept parts of oneself? It's a kind of rigidity that is not just about other people, but also is applied to the person himself, herself, themselves. Okay, things to think about. These are just the final questions um, at the end of this part. Next time, we are turning to evolutionary psychology, the uses and... <laughs> and misuses of evolutionary psychology. Thank you very much for your attention and until next time.